Welcome to Neuro Noodles Neurofeedback and Neuropsychology Podcast featuring tech legend Jay Gunkelman. He is the man who has read well over a half a million brain scans. Our goal is to provide information and promote options for better mental health. The Neuro Noodle Podcast is supported by listeners and businesses just like you. Like our gold supporter, Applied Neuroscience, and our silver supporter, Mind Media. Earn up to 16 CEU hours by attending Applied Neuroscience's NeuroGuide Workshop March 4th and 5th in Madeira Beach, Florida. It's led by none other than Dr. Robert Thatcher himself. There are two ways you can attend, online or in person, with the link appliedneuroscience.com slash attend hyphen ng hyphen workshops. Mind Media get the latest EEG and neurofeedback technology from mindmedia.com. Their semi-dry sensor cap is a wonder to see and their EEG amplifiers have been trusted in the field for decades. Their neurofeedback and QEG courses will get you up to speed in no time. Visit mindmedia.com now. Jake Uncleman, here we are, last show of 2022, going through the alphabet, a screen share I see in front of me. Yeah, well, we'll see what we can do with this one. And my title is is uh, edited slightly from the original PowerPoint where I was the QG diplomat, but now since I'm retired, I'm the first emeritus uh, QEG diplomat. Uh, although I was... Certificate number one for QEG. So I'm sure there's a lot of low number folks that are probably uh, going to be emeritus uh, as, as I am uh, fairly soon as well. Um, My hat is uh, off. <laughs> um, well, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a, uh, yeah, you have to be old and retired in order to get that kind of thing. So uh, um, I can't so I get mine. The, the letter today is F. And to start out, the International Federation of Clinical Neurophysiology position paper on what EEG is generated by uh, points to an authoritative uh, source for the generators of the, the EEG rhythmicity. But we're not going to focus on, uh, on these for the moment. We're focusing on the letter F. And here, F is for function. Uh, this, this is a graph looking at the EG frequencies across the x-axis, but the y-axis is function, measured by perfusion, which is a spec scan um, uh, a phenomenon. It can be measured also uh, other ways, uh, but basically if you're looking for metabolic function, spec scan is probably your best uh, measure. And um, uh, this uh, uh, shows that actually delta rhythm is a positive perfusion. Your brain is busy when delta is happening. During sleep, when your brain is busy you know, producing growth hormone and recovering from the wear and tear of the day. Uh, but you'll also notice that linked ears doesn't really correlate well with local function. Linked ears is this the bottom line here that doesn't have a good correlation. These are Laplacian techniques of global average and local average. And uh, they, they give you a very nice uh, correlation. Fast activity above 16 hertz is hyperperfusion. The 11 to about 16 hertz is a neutral positive perfusion above the mean, but not at two or three standard deviations. And then hypoperfusion is basically the alpha band up to about 11 hertz and the theta band down to about three or four hertz. But then comes delta, which is hyperperfusion. So it's not... The faster you are, the more perfusion there is. And perfusion, what the hell is perfusion? You know, so, you know, oh, it's this big word, you know. But perfusion basically is the ability of, of the, the body to burn uh, blood sugar with oxygen. And uh, that, that's all they're looking at here. And they measure it basically by giving you radioactively tagged glucose or oxygen. And at that point, they look at where in the body and how much of that uh, radioactivity. It's a very short half-life, but it is radioactive. And um, uh, there, there is a infinitesimally small uh, risk associated with it. Uh, but they're, you know, it's not inconsequential. It, it, it's 
manageable risk, basically. If you have to see your brain perfusion, um, it, it, it's, the, it's the study to do. Um, as an example, let's say you have cancer in some spot in your body and they want to see whether it's metastasized to somewhere. Well, they looked with a, they looked with a, a spec scan to see if the radioactivity is taken up by the rapidly metabolizing uh, cancer cells. So um, th this is uh, perfusion and the brain. Uh, perfusion happens elsewhere in the body as well. And again, rapidly uh, growing cells or very active cells uh, end up being the thing that take up that radioactivity and re-emit it so they can see it. So regardless of the location in the brain, if you see beta spindling, uh, fast activity up above 16 hertz, you've got hyperperfusion if you're looking with Laplace. If you're looking with linked ears, you may not see local function very well at all. Uh, local function is local, and linked ears is the difference between local and the ears. And that's not always a good reflection. You now, you can sometimes get a false image. And as you can see, uh, this study shows quite directly uh, that it's not optimal. This is by Ian Cook in the Journal of Electroencephalography and Clinical Neurophysiology, uh, number 107, 1998, uh, pages 408 to 414. And that, that's where this data can be found. And uh, uh, this was out of UCLA's um, NPI lab, the Neuropsych uh, Institute lab. Um, F for frontal. You know, uh, the, the, the frontal lobe has all these Fs up there. It's not like they failed. Uh, the, this F is for frontal, not for failure. F odd numbers are left side, even numbers are right side and Zs are at the midline. Um, you have other frontal electrodes that are inserted through the nose that are not commonly used anymore. Uh, they were about an eight inch long, uh, heavy gauge metal, about like a coat hanger uh, metal. Uh, they had a little bend in the middle of them and a silver ball on the end that was the electrode. And they're insulated except for the damn silver ball. The silver ball is a centimeter in size. Now, people don't necessarily know, like, how big is a damn centimeter? <laughs> you know, everybody knows inches and all of that. Well, the tip of your little finger is, is about the size of that silver ball. If you want to know what it feels like to have a nasopharyngeal lead placed, stick your finger to the hilt up your nose. That's what it feels like. It's awful. And it quite often tears tissue and you get a bloody nose out of it. And you've got two long wires with a bend in them and you stick them up your nose. If they crisscross, you don't know where they went. So if the person putting them in doesn't really know what they're doing, you don't even have an idea where those little silver balls went. Is the one up your right nostril twisted and off over to the left side and vice versa. So, um, and they're not very commonly done they, it, they look to show you the orbital frontal surface. And you can pick up the orbital frontal surface off of uh, uh, sphenoidal uh, electrodes as well. So uh, these are not as commonly done. Uh, they used to be done uh, pretty much as a routine. Uh, but you know, when your routine doesn't really give you anything additional, you have to think twice about a torturous routine that doesn't yield anything. So F for frontal, but you know, the frontal isn't just up front. Let's look at it a little bit more in detail. Each electrode actually has um, th th these, these little dots that are representative of where the F4 electrode actually was on individuals are now plotted on a standardized brain. And you can see there's actually a fair amount of scatter for where the actual electrodes ended up. And um, it, uh, you, you still have to put the electrodes where the, the measurements place them. But we used to think that they placed them over standardized locations in the brain. We'd have the exact gyrus or the exact sulcus. Um, not so. Uh, the brains aren't all standardized. Uh, we come in various sizes and shapes uh, outside. Well, we come with various sizes and shapes inside. When we looked at Einstein's brain, I would urge you to go back and look at that um, as a 
as a, 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 a series that we did. And you'll find lots of structural anomalies. And it wasn't just Einstein being weird. Um, everybody's brain is a little bit different. That's why your neurosurgeon hopes to hell you have a color-coded brain like this. Uh, that way they would know exactly where they were working. Now, uh, uh, the, the upper one is obviously the left hemisphere, the most well-described part of the brain. You'll find very few right hemispheric drawings by comparison to the left hemisphere. Everybody studied language, and the affective hemisphere went kind of ignored. You've got people sticking their names all over the left hemisphere, Wernicke and Broca. And, but the, the right hemisphere, you know, who the hell claimed the right hemisphere is theirs? You know, I make a bad joke about Wernicke having a sister who studied emotion. We'd have the name on both sides. It's just a bad joke. Don't worry. Wernicke is just left hemisphere. So this is all frontal and red. But the, the red that you see here that's a little bit more shiny bright red is the motor strip. The blue here that's a little darker blue is the somatosensory strip. The somatosensory somatomotor area is very tightly intertwined. They're hooked together with little arcuate fasciculi and F for fasciculi, we'll get to that later. Um, so the frontal lobe uh, includes the motor strip and it's related to the sensory area. Now, um, uh, here in the midline, we have the cingulate sitting on top of the corpus callosum. So the frontal lobe includes potentially some frontal aspect of the anterior cingulate, which is a, an important aspect of the cingulate. It gives you uh, functional flexibility, F for flexibility. If you have emotional and cognitive flexibility, the cingulate is doing its job. When it's not working, you're either stuck on, like OCD, or you're stuck off, a motivation, lack of initiation, procrastination. And we can't tell based on the EEG whether it's locked on or off. We could just tell it's not working right. And the behavior is pretty obvious at that point as to whether it's locked on or locked off. Uh, the logical extreme uh, ends up with an atonic uh, mute, uh, uh, somebody who doesn't react or respond uh, to anything. And they, that's the anterior cingulate as well. So let's look a little deeper into the front. This is the temporal lobe split down. We, we opened up uh, the, the temporal lobe to show the insula and the auditory cortex, which is on the inside of the temporal junction here. This goes from high frequencies to low frequencies, just like the cochlea in your ear, the, the little snail in your ear. The big fat end of the snail is low frequency. The little tippy point of the snail is, is high frequency. So uh, from high frequency to low frequency, this is a point by point representation of the cochlea. And that's where you hear. Now you don't see it on the surface because when this is folded up, they actually point up towards the top of your head. Uh, uh, auditory event related, uh, excuse me, auditory brainstem, auditory evoke responses, BEAR, B-A-E-R testing, they measure at CZ for your auditory response. They do that testing on infants that can't, that, that they think might not be able to hear. Now, uh, um, it, it, we've kind of looked at the fact that the temporal lobe's hanging down here to uh, kind of show some hidden uh, areas, but uh, the, the red and uh, orange are all in the front. So uh, motor, uh, the sensory strip or the motor strip. But the pink area just in front of the motor strip is important. Uh, the supplementary or supramotor area is where the pianist sits. The pianist plays the piano. The piano doesn't play itself. The motor strip is where the keyboard is but the frontal lobe is what plays that keyboard. So movement is not necessarily executed in the, you know, initiated from the motor strip. It's executed in the motor strip. The initiation of movement, the intention to move, all of that is frontal. The intention to move has a gigantic German word that's one big long word, Bereitschaft's potential. Potential is not a separate word. It's Bereitschaft's potential. That's one giant word. 
it, it, it's a readiness potential. When you intend to move, the frontal lobe lights up with electronegativity in the premotor area, uh, the area that would essentially initiate the movement. And we've got the speech motor area, Broca's area also in the front, um, uh, uh, Wernicke's area at, at the back here is auditory comprehension and visual comprehension for language. So receptive language. Uh, if it doesn't work, you hear what they call word salad. It doesn't make any sense. It's just random damn words that don't mean anything. If the speech area doesn't work, you produce word salad. Uh, gobbledygook comes out of your mouth that doesn't make any sense. And, you know, uh, what is it? Bruce Willis has got an expressive aphasia and he had to quit acting because, you know, well, you know, he didn't have really big lines usually in the, uh, w w when he was acting, but nevertheless, um, you've got to be able to speak some, um, you know, that there are some stars that basically have brief one-liners and most of it is just physical action. You know, I'll be back, you know, it's, it's big lines like that. But if you can't speak, you'll probably not be in acting very long. And, um, and Bruce is appropriately spending time with his family while he can still communicate with them. Um, and uh, Broca's uh, aphasia is really quite debilitating. Uh, our inability to, 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 to speak eliminates our ability to function in society largely. And it's not like it's just speaking. You can't find the words to write them either. So a, a speech motor, uh, if you can't find the words to speak them, you probably aren't writing them either. Um, now, uh, uh, the, uh, let, let's go to another. You can see frontal lobe atrophy here. You can see how deep the sulci are and how spindly little the gyri are. They call this a ropey. It looks like, and sometimes they refer to this as intestinal. It looks intestinal. Well, it isn't like fluid flows down the intestines here to get out to some other spot. I mean, in, in fact, there were early uh, 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 attempts to understand the brain that thought humors flowed through these tubes, and it, that's obviously not the case. So uh, um, th this has frontal lobe and temporal lobe uh, tropic changes, atrophy. Uh, at the back of that in sensory areas, the, they're still fairly tight. Uh, the, these, this area hasn't had the same uh, tropic changes. And obviously, memory and yeah, uh, movement and thinking and speaking all are going to be impaired with this. Now, up front, we, we talked about the motor strip and the, and the supplementary supramotor area. Uh, but, you know, uh, uh, the motor strip itself has the homunculus in it. And this is a motor homunculus. And the reason I know it's a motor homunculus is that it has no genitals. Right next to the toes in the sensory homunculus, you'll have the genitals. Maybe those people with a foot fetish have something. Who knows? Um, but the, uh, uh, you can see the... The feet are dangled down into the into the central uh, 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 fissure, and uh, about where C three C four are are the hand. You get this distorted little creature with a gigantic hand, a big face, little spindly body, um, and then what's interesting is as as you you see the face, uh, the tongue and the inside of the mouth are here as you dip into the sylvian fissure, but the entire alimentary tract. Uh, are are, are uh, displayed along this until you get to the insula. The posterior aspect of, of the insula uh, includes your visceral uh, smooth muscle control. So a discharge deep in the insula can actually give you abdominal spasms. The old term abdominal epilepsy was fairly descriptive. Um, yeah, it obviously pointed uh, it, uh, fairly directly to the spot that would be of interest. Uh, that, as a description, has been long lost. I mean, there's an international classification system for epilepsy, and the abdominal epilepsy is not part of that. 
uh, although I, I think it was a, a, a fairly uh, interesting uh, description. There are a lot of people that have abdominal distress uh, that you can test everything in their abdomen and it's not a problem there. The problem is actually up in the insula uh, causing uh, muscle spasms in the in, in internal organs. Um, yeah, this is in the in the spine. This is not part of the discussion. You don't have a little face in your in your spine, but this is indicating the motor neurons in, in the arms and it, uh, kind of the spatial layout uh, similar to the body structure. The bottom one here has the frontal eye fields. If you stimulate the frontal eye fields, you get movement of the eyes. If you stimulate in one spot, you'll deviate the eyes to the left or the right or up or down. Uh, the direction of the eye movement is uh, based on where you stimulate is indicated by the arrows here. Um, the frontal lobe does not give you visual acuity, which way the E is pointing on the chart when you have to you know, tell the, the, the doctor which way the E is pointing to see whether you can get 20-20 vision or not. This has to do with accommodation and convergence, the ability of the eyes to actually work, to scan a page and continue to focus together. If convergence doesn't work, you can get double vision and, you know, your eyes aren't pointed properly. Uh, so accommodation and convergence are uh, controlled by the frontal eye fields in the brain frontally. Again, F for frontal. Um, uh, the eyes have been removed. We've got high-speed fiber tracks here that move vision from the lateral geniculate and the thalamus. The eyes are missing. It's the, there's the optic chiasm, comes back to the lateral geniculate and these high-speed uh, uh, tracks, again, fiber tracks, go back to the visual cortex. Upper and lower visual fields are split and uh, right and left are split. So your upper left visual quadrant goes to the right lower uh, cortex um, below the calcarine fissure, and the calcarine fissure splits the occipital lobe uh, top to bottom. Um, um, we, we've got lots of uh, uh, cortical uh, features like this, but uh, uh, and it, it, luckily we don't need to know every little nook and cranny because the skull and skin and meninges sitting on top of the brain smear focal findings to about a six centimeter uh, uh, spot. A focal finding might be two to four millimeters in size and you get a six centimeter spread on the surface. So uh, something that comes from a dot ends up having a giant plate around it. And uh, so we, we, you know, from the outside, we don't necessarily need to know quite this much detail. It's good to know it, but the, your your resolution with the EEG is, is not as uh, tightly resolved as the neuroanatomy when you actually get in there. If you do corticograms, then you need to know all of this and more. Fasciculi. You know, um, uh, the, the, the homologous locations communicate back and forth. This is the uh, uh, posterior commissure and the anterior commissure and the, 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 the uh, cingulate in, in between them. Excuse me, corpus callosum in, in between them, uh, communicating high-speed connections back and forth. Um, th this allows uh, for the brain to function, but it also allows the brain to dysfunction. If you have an epileptiform discharge in the right uh, uh, posterior quadrant, uh, it's likely to cause a disturbance on the other side because they're very tightly intertwined. Uh, Barry Sturman and Delee Lance did a nice study showing that uh, when people are scheduled for brain surgery to get the bad side to not make the good side act badly, um, they, they did neurofeedback instead of neurosurgery on a bunch of them. And the bad side gets better and the good side gets better. The ones who have surgery, the good side gets better, but the bad side is gone. There's no improvement in function on that side. So the, the superior approach was actually neurofeedback, not brain surgery for these folks. Um, anyway, uh, we can see the high-speed connections. Uh, from the mid-temporal to the anterior temporal pole, 
they go through the anterior commissure, not to the, not not uh, uh, through the corpus callosum, and uh, that's important if you're teaching models of how you think neurofeedback works. T3, T4 don't go through the corpus callosum; they go through the anterior commissure. If you're describing uh, um, a mechanism uh, in a group, uh, if you don't get the neuroanatomy correct on your model, uh, you might end up having People that know the neuroanatomy just quit listening. So uh, let, let's keep our neuroanatomy straight. But these are are, are the simple side to side ones. There's also uh, an association fiber front to back. Now let's look at those a little bit more closely. Um, uh, the this is the unsynet fasciculus. The the uncus is where you smell things and taste things. Um, Smell goes directly to the olfactory bulb and goes right over here. Uh, taste, on the other hand, goes down through the brainstem um, and back up to the same location. And smell and taste are so highly intertwined that if you lose the sense of smell, largely your sense of taste is not so intact. A lot of people have found that out, unfortunately, because of COVID having the loss of sense of smell and taste. Now, uh, uh, this is the unsinate fasciculus. It's bidirectional. It's from the lateral and orbital frontal sites to the uncus. This allows the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe to communicate back and forth. Um, and it, it's a, a busy uh, uh, little pathway um, uh, that, that allows uh, things like distract the, the frontal area here. It keeps distractions from... Uh, 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 disturbing your comprehension. Longitudinal fasciculus, superior and inferior longitudinal fasciculus, these long tracts, little arcuate fasciculi connecting one spot to the next. And these fasciculi end up helping to integrate upper and lower visual fields and integrate your vision into a percept and that can then be comprehended in the temporal area. So all of these high-speed fasciculi end up being fully operable in a busy brain. When you're talking about brains being networked, these high-speed white matter connections are highly important, but they're not the only connection. You know, um, there's a, a, a unfortunately a false model of uh, connectivity or coherence-related connecti connectivity that's taught, the two compartmental model of, of connectivity, uh, suggesting that only local or distant can be connected, suggesting that it's a cortical cortical connection. Um, the thing is, Steriati's group in the International Federation of Clinical Neurophysiology position paper on EEG generators shows that if you cut the white matter connection between two cortical locations, the coherence at those two locations do not change. It's not a cortical cortical system. It's a cortical thalamocortical system. It doesn't go cortical cortical. If you cut that connection, you don't change the coherence. If you disturb the thalamus, the coherence goes away. If you disturb the, the connection between the cortex and the thalamus, the coherence goes away. So it, uh, it, the, the two compartmental model um, uh, cortical cortical connectivity is just wrong. Uh, it's been proven to be wrong by the International Federation and that they state as such in the in their uh, position paper on EG generators. Earn up to 16 CEU hours by attending Applied Neurosciences NeuroGuide Workshop March 4th and 5th in Madeira Beach, Florida. It's led by none other than Dr. Robert Thatcher himself. There are two ways you can attend, online or in person, with the link appliedneuroscience.com slash attend hyphen ng hyphen workshops. The last F. This is the Falk cerebri. This is the lining, the dura matter lining between the hemispheres. Obviously, the hemispheres themselves have been evacuated. And all we have is this very, very tough shoe leather like uh, uh, piece of tissue uh, between the two hemispheres. When you're young, 
this is pliable and flexible. Now, I'm 74. Mine is probably like shoe leather. Um, you know, at, at, at advancing ages, even in your 30s and 40s, this becomes tough and stiff. If you've ever done a brain dissection, you tried to, 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 to break this tissue to get out the cerebellum, the tentorum, you know how tough it is. You, you just about have to put a foot on the top of the head here to cut, to, to tear it. I mean, it's, it's very, very, very tough. Now, what happens is that this sits between the hemispheres. Let's say you suddenly decelerate, you know, a head-on car crash, or you're running forward and you get, you know, suddenly stopped by somebody on a football field. Head-to-head, uh, -head, helmet to helmet, you know, contact. Uh, uh, and your, your brain continues moving forward as you suddenly stop the body. Uh, the brain moves forward. The falx cerebri between the hemispheres actually damages uh, the, the connectivity between the frontal lobes. Barry Sturman uh, showed in some head injuries, you have a decrease in the what he uh, 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 measures is light coherence is co-modulation. It's a spectral correlation. That's a, a Pearson R related spectral correlation, um, not uh, coherence, which uh, coherence doesn't require things to be uh, time locked and, and uh, um, the, uh, the, the uh, co-modulation is uh, it more instantaneously time locked. But uh, the, the right and left frontal lobes, the correlation drops again because of damage from the Fox cerebri. And the, um, that's basically a whole bunch of Fs um, uh, at, as we move through the alphabet. Fabulous. Now we may, we, <laughs> funny, <laughs> fabulous. <laughs> a couple other words in there we can't say in the show. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> WTF, you know. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, but, uh, um, you know, as we go through the alphabet, uh, one letter at a time, we illustrate little bits of neuroanatomy, uh, neurophysiology, neurofeedback terms, and things such as that. So we all uh, end up having a little foundational uh, uh, boost in our knowledge base. So, Well, Jay, we had a hell of a 2022, uh, another great year. Uh, we had a... We had a uh, a lot of shows, uh, show every week. Some were watched more than others. And the, the most popular show every year, the second year in a row, is why does Michael Jordan stick his tongue out? <laughs> you, <laughs> of all the, all the good work that you do in the screen shares, what, <laughs> I guess it's Michael Jordan, but... Just for the well, people maybe have just tripped over the show and they fell into it. Like, why does Michael Jordan stick his tongue out, Jay? Well, you know, uh, um, it, it's not just Michael Jordan. You know, um, whenever my mother would thread a needle, she would have her tongue out. <laughs> and whenever she did some other really fine tasks, she would stick her tongue out. Now, it didn't make threading the needle any easier to have your tongue stuck out. It doesn't make Michael Jordan's shots better. Uh, it, it's superstitious behavior. And there's nothing stronger than a superstitious behavior. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the, at the state hospital where my lab was in 1972, we had one guy who had an OCD uh, uh, thing where every, whenever he walked through a doorway, he had to touch both sides and the top. And if you saw him walking down the hall, there were there's like a doorway and then it, it, it turns and there's another doorway. You see him with his hands shooting up and down and off to the side. It didn't make his walking any more efficient. Uh, it, uh, obviously, it made him stand out quite a bit. Sticking your tongue out when you're doing something kind of stands out, um, and and people look at it and go, well, "Gee, that's that's odd or that's funny," um, but it's just a superstitious behavior. 
There are athletes who don't want to change the socks that they wore when they had a good game. Um, they'll have a, a, a pre uh, game routine. Um, I was a swimmer, a competitive swimmer. I had my routine. Uh, actually somebody on my team came over and, you know, gave, gave me a kind of a tap upside the shoulder and, and wish me luck. I slugged him. He, he interrupted my routine, you know? <laughs> so, um, you know, the, uh, it, 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 it it's it's not something you have to do, uh, but it's something you do to get your mind straight about what you're about to do. And if Michael Jordan does better when he sticks his tongue out for his superstition, it's still if he's doing better because he's superstitious, so what? <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, everybody has silly superstitions. Uh, um, uh, the, uh, some are more obvious than others. So what's the difference between superstition and like obsessive compulsive disorder? Not much. <laughs> 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 um, you know, that he has the compulsion to do it. He's not necessarily obsessed with it. I mean, he's not walking around thinking, God, uh, I, I, I need to stick my tongue out. You know, uh, this is something that's automatic. Um, it, it's, it's built into his, uh, the, his overlearned procedure, um, the way he shoots the shot, you know, and every little bit of how you shoot the shot ends up be, being important. And if a superstition is part of your routine to get to that end point, uh, so what the little superstition is pretty much everywhere. It's just superstition. It probably doesn't have to happen. You could learn your way out of it if it's socially embarrassing to do something that you're superstitious about. Walking down the hall, touching the top and sides of all the doors, will get you stuck in a state hospital. You know, as a yeah, so something not quite right there. You know, but nobody is going to take Michael Jordan off the, the basketball floor for having shot with his tongue out. Um, you know. Um, You'll see other people with their own uh, superstitions. Sometimes it's something that they do after the shot. Uh, uh, the, but it's it, it's superstitious behavior. Uh, again, probably uh, driven by the anterior cingulate, which holds it in a model of what you think the world should be like. And if the world is better with the tongue sticking out before your shot, then that's uh, that's what the cigarette's going to have you doing. Um, if you have clinical OCD, your superstitious behavior uh, becomes outrageously odd, and uh, you're going to be inefficient. You're going to end up being uh, classified as having a, a pathology at that point. Uh, you wash your hands. The anterior cigarette holds a model of how things should be. And when you're done washing your hands, if you get an error code from your anterior singlet, you wash your hands again, no matter how well you wash your hands. You could be a surgeon scrubbing, you know, rubbing and scrubbing for minutes and minutes and minutes and, you know, uh, turning things on and off with your foot or your elbow. And when you're done, you start it all over again because your anterior singlet tells you it didn't quite work. You lock the lock. It's perfectly well locked. You know it's perfectly well locked, but you will go back and check it and check it and check it. Uh, uh, obsessions about cleanliness, obsessions about locks, obsessions about superstitious behaviors uh, end up being uh, common. And um, I've got nothing uh, against somebody sticking their tongue out when they shoot basketball or when they thread a needle or uh, when they're doing something that requires fine dexterity, um, if, if that is, you know, what gets you through it, that gets you through it, you know? Um, and we all have our little quirks, me included. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what could that be? You know? So, uh, um, you know, uh, I have my obsession about EEG, you know? So, of course you do. Uh, and then, Jay, for this year, one of the more popular episodes, uh, photobiomodulation with Dr. Lou Lim from Violite. 
is light going to be more, you know, more mainstream or is it mainstream? I, I, well, I, I'm saying it is because it's very com- people watched it on our, on our podcast. Complementary and alternative medicine cam is becoming more and more popular, uh, primarily because of the progressive failure of you know, current medicine's approach on a lot of things. Uh, a lot of our uh, disorders uh, in the DSM don't have obvious treatments, and an alternative treatment may end up being what you end up seeking because the traditional approaches haven't been successful. The neurofeedback world ends up seeing a lot of those patients. You know, if if you have epilepsy and you went to the doctor and they gave you a pill and it worked, you're not going to be going out to see a whole bunch of other people. It worked. You're successfully doing what you did uh, with a with a pill. Uh, but let's say you're one of the third of epileptics that are intractable and the pills don't work at all. Well, you're going to be looking around for alternative therapies. And it, although it's still rare, some people actually find neurofeedback as a treatment alternative in, in epilepsy. Uh, we've got very good success with it, um, but it's not well known. And, you know, uh, um, uh, you're not in competition with the other people in the field if your customers don't know who you are, where you are, what you do, or how to get a hold of you. At that point, you're in coopetition. The more publicity you generate for the field, the better everybody's slice of the pie is. Don't worry about the degrees of radius of your slice of the pie. Worry about the size of the pie. And, you know, very narrow slice with a gigantic pie, you got a lot to eat. So, uh, again, coopetition is, is the right model for the neurofeedback world because our clients don't know who we are, how to get a hold of us, or what right, we do. Right. So. Then chronic fatigue syndrome, that was a big one. Well, uh, um, <laughs> uh, uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, long hauler syndrome uh, from COVID, there's, there's a lot of these that were at one point point chronic fatigue was thought of as you know something's not right but it's not a medical thing something's just not right with this person but that wasn't really the case uh, that they, they actually have autoimmune markers um you you can have your immune system attacking various uh parts of you your thyroid they're what your energy uh your your myelin well they're what your brain function So uh, autoimmune against myelin in its logical extreme is MS. Um, Other autoimmune issues are like ALS, uh, 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 Lou Gehrig's uh, disease uh, is more more commonly known perhaps, uh, at least for uh, people that are old enough to remember Lou Gehrig. Um, I guess that's kind of lost on a lot of younger folks, but Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's history, you know? Yeah. And uh, let's see, uh, uh, EEG certification types. That was a very popular one, Jay, that you led. Gee, who would want to ever be certified in EEG? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody that touches my head. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, uh, and I'm certifiable in EEG, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, but, you know, it, it, actually getting deeper in your knowledge base and passing certification exams as a, a proof of competence. Um, now, if you're a psychologist and you want to practice neurofeedback, it's under your licensure. I mean, psychologists can do neurofeedback. But if you're doing some neurofeedback and you're called in front of your licensing board, they're going to want to know how did you get competent at that technique? Well, show them your certification. <laughs> so um, certifying in EEG, certifying in neurofeedback, certifying in uh, 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 TMS, certifying in whatever approach you're using, you should end up uh, being able to show your competence if you're challenged. And if you're not independently competent, you need to have good mentorship or supervision. 
Now, mentorship is uh, a less uh, specific word. Uh, it's specific for the certification bodies because they didn't want to use the term supervision because supervision has legal, you know, uh, legal meaning within professions. Um, uh, if you have a, 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 a supervisor as a PhD psychologist, that supervision ends up having uh, uh, their licensure and insurance and everything as part of the deal. You know, um, uh, you're, they're literally uh, uh, over you um, in, in the responsibility uh, uh, on what's being done. So uh, um, mentorship is like supervision, but without the, the legal entanglement and uh, insurance entanglement and that sort of thing. Um, that doesn't mean somebody who's a mentor shouldn't be insured. Um, you know, everybody should have their own uh, professional liability coverage because to err is human. And, uh, and you know, we're working with uh, people that aren't necessarily fully intact. And uh, some of them have uh, abreactive uh, responses to anything and everything. So you can kind of expect uh, uh, one out of every few dozen to end up having uh, some kind of a side effect uh, that, uh, that, that you end up having to respond to. And if they, uh, are, if they're litigious, uh, that side effect may bring uh, litigation and you, you should be covered for that. Um, and you may do something that's perfectly logical and appropriate and have an outcome that's not predictable. Uh, and, and you, you need to be able to cover the, problem for your client with your liability insurance. The errors and omissions are, are protective, not just of you. They're also protective of your clients. Then what happened to Bob Saget? That was a big one. Uh, oh, another big one. The Jay Gunkelman story, part <laughs> one, two, and three. Oh my goodness! <laughs> you, you couldn't pile it high enough and deep enough in one. You had to do three of them, huh? So, All you ever wanted to know. It's, it's here. <laughs> uh, well, my life is an open book, and and I, it's not like I'm hiding anything. That's for sure. Uh, neuroinflammation, TACS, TDCS, and SMR was a big one. Well, you know. Uh, the technical detail within the field needs to be focused on. And uh, every little piece of the field has its own technical detail. A SMR is, is part of the foundation of the field. And yet it's still kind of misunderstood by a lot of folks in the field. Um, and it's undervalued, I think, as, as well. Uh, it, it's one of the foundational pieces. And it, it may be an old approach, but it works like a charm. So... Um, uh, for the things it's appropriate for, it's a perfect tool. And um, uh, we, uh, 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 knowing a little bit more about it and how it came about, how Barry found it, um, what the variability in tuning is, uh, where you can find it. Uh, you know, there's a lot of spots up there. Uh, you know, where is it SMR? Where is it something else uh, with the same frequency band? You know, so... Uh, you know, the, the technical detail uh, ends up being uh, enough of an interest to end up bringing people in to learn the minutia about uh, each of these terms. Then QEG versus spec scan. Hey, um, you know, uh, they're both assessment techniques. And uh, spec scan is very common in, uh, for instance, Amon's clinics uh, that uh, a lot of their work is based on the spec scan uh, to assess brain function. And it does a better job than EG at looking at deep brain structures. Um, you can see the, uh, the basal ganglia and the thalamus and the, cere the uh, cerebellum and all of these deeper structures that are classically considered non EG generators. You got to stick a needle into them in order to see them. And it's not like there's not function going on in them uh, because the spec scan will show you the perfusion, high perfusion, low perfusion, 
and what spot. Um, EEG has some superiority over uh, spec scan because hypoperfusion could be theta, could be slowed alpha, could be regular frequency alpha. All three of those require totally different medication interventions. If it's theta frontocentrally, it's related to dopamine. Um, if it's slowed alpha, it's related to norepinephrine deficits. If it's regular alpha and it's up front, you end up usually having an SSRI or SNRI fix for it. So um, the, the spec scan points to the frontal lobe hypoperfusion, but we can subtype that three different ways with EEG that predict different medication interventions. So, the, you know, uh, is, is one test perfect? Oh, hell no. Is the other test perfect? Oh, hell no. Um, if you integrate things together, do you get a better picture of how things work? Yeah. Functional MRI um, it adds to structural MRI. Uh, functional MRI added together with EEG end up being tremendously important. Uh, functional MRI shows you the bold response, blood oxygen uh, level. And um, that corresponds with the very slow frequencies by generated by glia, metabolic uh, functions within the brain, not faster oscillatory stuff. And it takes specs. It, it, it takes the functional MRI, you know, tens of seconds, sometimes twenty seconds, to generate an image, and that smears time. And the EEG shows time resolution in the millisecond time domain. So uh, adding tests together to get a better idea of the location based on structural imaging of the MRI and functional MRI, along with temporal imaging of the EEG ends up giving you a spatial and temporal model of what's going on that surpasses either of the two by themselves. Then, Jay, winding up our top viewed uh, episodes, Ruth Lanius, PTSD Emotions, and more with Seaburn Fisher and Jay Gunkelman. Hey, how can you not have a good show with those two fabulous women on the show? You know, I've I'm a little runt of a tech and, and they're, they're both absolutely stars in their field. So um, I can see why that episode uh, went, went big. Um, it, it, you, you can't get much bigger in the era that they're in than those two names. So uh, obviously I, I've known Seaburn a lot longer uh, than Ruth, um, but they're, they're both, you know, brilliant. And, um, and, and the, uh, the, the 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 detail uh, um, work coming out uh, uh, for Muth on PTSD using imaging technology, not not as you know. There's a lot of psychiatrists that uh, uh, their analysis of something is basically a verbal analysis. It's it's all uh, talking theoretical modeling. Uh, stuff, but she's actually in there with with, with uh, imaging studies uh, showing uh, pathways and structures in their involvement. And uh, it, it's good to see psychiatry actually getting back into brain function with actual testing and uh, looking at the brain itself. Uh, 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 psychiatry and neurology were at one point the same uh, certification. But if you go into EEG, uh, a psychiatrist is forced to go back and take a neurology residency um, to, to kind of dampen down their psychiatric approach to things and give them the more classical neurological approach uh, uh, to things. You know, um, uh, Isaac Asimov, a long time ago, uh, wrote uh, 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 about a society and on a, in a different world entirely, uh, originated on Earth uh, with what we have here, but it's, it's now long lost in history that everything came from the Earth at all. And he actually talks about EEG. And uh, EEG has become uh, uh, a lost art. They don't even know where it came from anymore. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the, they believe that every little thing 
about you is reflected in the EEG. Um, you know, little, little, you know, the, the billions of, of connections in there that are operating end up reflecting everything about you, uh, as, a, as opposed to the, the current neurology that's epilepsy and encephalopathies that you could diagnose. Everything else is uh, psychiatry and that's not EEG. So, um, but Asimov's uh, uh, approach in the distant future had some uh, uh, some descendant of a very popular political figure, and he was all hooked up. Uh, and, and he wouldn't look at the EEG because then he would try to control it. <laughs> so, uh, you know, kind of uh, alluding to maybe some kind of feedback or something. Anyway, it was, uh, uh, you know, uh, science fiction written a long, long time ago uh, that, that kind of hints at EEG being reflective of neurocognitive function, not just you know, traditional medical uh, approach. Jay, another great show, another great year, my friend. Can't wait till next year, next week. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, 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 uh, this, this coming year, I'll turn 74, and we're going to try and have another uh, uh, three-day EEG party here in town. Jay, say hi to Renita. <sighs> Have Happy a great New day. Year. <laughs> Happy New Year to everybody that watches the show. And um, uh, thank you for watching, listening. Thank you to our supporters out there. It's a real ego boost. We'll keep grinding away another year. See you in 2023. And and I hope that they send suggestions for uh, topics and questions and yes. that sort of thing because it helps. Yes. Um, if we know what they need to know we can provide it if we don't know what they need to know it's hard we can stumble on it but it's right. it's better if they actually give us a little breadcrumb trail as to where they think we, we, we should be going so amen Jay. thanks thanks to you for setting this up and thanks to everybody thanks who, to who you follows for putting us. something on it <laughs> we'll catch you next year all right buddy take care bye-bye the Neuro Noodle Podcast is supported by listeners and businesses just like you, like our gold supporter, Applied Neuroscience, and our silver supporter, Mind Media. Earn up to 16 CEU hours by attending Applied Neuroscience's NeuroGuide Workshop March 4th and 5th in Madeira Beach, Florida. It's led by none other than Dr. Robert Thatcher himself. There are two ways you can attend, online or in person, with the link AppliedNeuroscience.com slash attend hyphen ng hyphen workshops. Mind Media get the latest EEG and neurofeedback technology from MindMedia.com. Their semi dry sensor cap is a wonder to see, and their EEG amplifiers have been trusted in the field for decades. The neurofeedback and QEG courses will get you up to speed in no time. Visit MindMedia.com now. <laughs>